So everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Wayne Conger. I'm the founder and CEO of Hut. Today, we're going to go through a new webinar series that we call How We Do It. I know that there are questions on all the steps in our process, and we're working through this series to break up into kind of digestible chunks. Um, how do we do each part of our uh, design and development sequence? And today, we're going to be focused on how do we do it standards modification? How do we take our standards products and turn them into unique properties for our clients all over the country? Let me get started. So where are we talking about within the HUTS design and development sequence today? So you can see this is a really, really stripped down version of what a pretty typical HUT sequence looks like and the phases of work that we go through when we help our clients design and develop their property. In some cases, it starts with land sourcing, then going through planning and groundwork and improving a lot, then design, working with our standards, um, modification, visualization, interior specifications, contractor sourcing, documentation for permitting and construction, uh, bid, and then into construction. And this is a really reduced version for those, anyone out here who is currently working with us or anyone who is thinking about working with us. Our kind of full project sequence is a very detailed Gantt chart in our, in our project management system, but this sort of a reduced version for these purposes. And so where we're talking about today is kind of phase three in our design, modification, visualization, interior spec section, and specifically modifications. And so you might be asking if you're not familiar or you don't follow along that closely, what exactly are these standards that I'm talking about? And so you can learn all about standards on our site. This is just a quick look at our uh, navigation. If you go to standards and go down to the HUT standards section, I'll actually do it myself right now. Here we are at huts.com. I'll open up the site. Standards, HUT standards. And everything about standards is in, in here, both how we utilize them, um, the standard types themselves, and our ADU standards, kind of smaller, smaller plans. And when we go into our HUT standards, you can see that they're organized by studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom, with the option to sort of scale them and grow them a bit over time. And so what our standards are, are really home products, more than just plans. They are fully documented design types and home types where we've worked out much of the structural engineering, we've worked out much of the mechanical approach, much of the specifications, in a way that allows us to know market by market, location by location, a, a lot of the pricing that goes into the, uh, the construction pricing that goes into the house. And this is a major difference from, say, if you were to work with a custom architect who might be working from a blank page. They have to go through a design exercise and a pretty detailed one before they can solicit from a contractor a bid that tells them what this thing costs. In our case, our standards are a way for us to not start from a blank page and instead put our clients in the editor's seat where they're starting from something pretty close to what they have in mind um, and sort of push and pull it. And then at the same time, a spot where we're able to pretty accurately estimate what the pricing will be because we've developed the product so, so deeply. And instead of being told by the contractor what the cost will be, we often know up front and are able to help through this modification process our clients make informed decisions on how certain modifications are not just compelling on the design side, but what the ramifications are on the construction budget side. I want to expand it and pull the house apart a little bit. I want to add a laundry room. I want to add a loft. I want to start push and pull it to make it mine. These can be great design ideas, but they're only as good as your ability to execute on them. And so our, our standards as products allow us to match the, that design criteria with a anticipated construction budget impact um, and to be able to do that way up front and well before we have a contractor involved. So these are our standards and um, you can see we've got our uh, ADU units, uh, our small bar, dog trot, medium bar, small L, big bar, big L, village scheme, and then iterations of those where they kind of get added and, um, and aggregated together. And so let's head back to presentation now that we remember what standards are and look at the ways in which we modify them. And so one of the questions you might be asking is, why would I modify them? You might go through our site and say, 
I love the medium bar, or I love the Hutz Village. But the thing is, those plans and those those standards are sort of floating in space. They have they've not yet hit your land. They've not let yet been viewed through your lifestyle, local code requirements, or or your budget. And so it's usually across these five, four criteria that we start massaging and pushing and pulling the standard. On the land side, what that tends to mean is not just orientation. And so how might we change um, window locations? How might we uh, rotate or mirror the house plan? But also, what is the topography and the uh, the condition of how the house meets the ground? Is it going to sit on uh, on piers? Is it going to sit on a full foundation? Is it going to sit on slab on grade or a rat slab? What's the way in which this sort of floating house type ends up hitting the ground? And one of the things that we always care deeply about is how to make it feel like the house has maybe been there for a bit. When you see a lot of new construction, it has this quality of the lot looks a little bit like it was napalmed, kind of clear cut, and then a house got dropped on top of it. And it sort of feels a little bit like a UFO landing. One of the things that we care a lot about with producing something contextual to land is that what's the right foundation condition to make it feel like the house sort of is emerging from the property, that maybe it's been there before, and not only that, that it belongs there. Then you have lifestyle revisions. Um, our standards, again, are starting point. They tend to get people 80%, 85% of the way there, where they understand the scale, they have a good idea of what the pricing would be, but they may have unique conditions, whether it's I have a special hobby that needs a dedicated loft space that is sort of designed for that purpose. We're working on a project right now where fly tying for fly fishing is a big part of the program, where how do we make sure that we create a dedicated space for that? And does our standard allow for it, or do we need to add a piece um, or, or, or shift something to allow for it? And this can take any number of factors, whether it's gyms or office spaces or even like breezeways, because this is a ski house and the idea of kind of coming directly in with all of your gear and your boots and coming right inside just doesn't make that much sense. And we need a transition there from indoors to outdoors. And so the ways in which we start to make this standard particular to you is that we try to imagine how are you actually going to use the house? How is this place going to become the backdrop for the lifestyle that you hope to live? And usually that means that the standard gets sort of modified in ways to make it more particular for you. The next is around local code. You'll see a little later in the presentation how we've applied uh, standards to development projects in uh, completely opposite ends of the, the country from the same starting plan in Maine as we're using in California. Now, these two places couldn't have, have very, very different um, permitting requirements based on uh, local conditions, whether it's you know up in the Northeast where you might have special wind conditions, you have um, huge snow loads, which uh, impact uh, truss size and roof condition. Whereas in California, you have seismic conditions that you need to account for and other sorts of details that need to be shown to the local municipality to hit code. And so that becomes a bit of the required revision and modification to, let's say, localize the standard to the market where you're going to build. And the last, and, and but certainly not least, and one that we care deeply about is budget. How do we kind of flex up and flex down on, on both material selections, on the amount of um, uh, windows is a big one uh, for controlling cost, and some of the overall sizing to try to go from the standard and some of the pricing that we estimate for it out of the box, and then maybe value engineer it a little bit to fit your target budget. And so it's usually through these four lenses that your land, your lifestyle, your local code conditions, and your budget that the standard goes from being something that you see on our site, which is a bit of a, a floating product, to a house that's really yours. The next question that most folks ask is, what kinds of modifi modifications can I make? What does it mean to push and pull the place? And, and how do we think about the implication of pushing and pulling? And how much can I push and pull it before it's no longer a standard and becomes something else? And so I think one of the important things to think about as a framework for our modifications is that what we do here in this design phase um, and how much we modify this, this plan, and most of this we work on in 3D, and we 
as we're making these revisions, we're sort of actually going into the house placed on a model of your real site so we can really see how any of these changes um, alter the experience inside of the property. But as we make those changes, where they have an impact is here in documentation, that you always need to go from these kind of design ideas and the, the kind of world of 3D modeling and the world of kind of defining the space into a series of documents that are required for permit offices and required for construction. And so if we get sort of very wild and very outside of the box here, it tends to mean that um, we're going to have some, uh, some timing implication and cost implication downstream here in documentation. And so we kind of look and categorize our modifications in, in three groups, simply small, medium, and large. And I think one of the ways to think about small, medium, and large is not what we're changing, but the type of question somebody might ask. We've kind of gone through this many times, and we were able to bucket pretty typical responses that when people say, hey, I really, really love the small L, but can I do this? And so it's a way for you to think about what's small, what's medium, and what's large. So for instance, we might hear from a client on the small side, hey, can I move that window? Or can we shift that interior wall? It's not load bearing, it's not gonna change any plumbing. Um, let's include a loft without um, adding a full second floor. Let's uh, add length to the space. Let's change a finish, a fixture, or a material. These are things that we hear all the time. We sort of account, we account for in our process and in our, uh, in our approach and in our scopes of work many, many of these revisions to happen. And they have very little downstream impact in this relationship that you can make as many of those sort of design modifications as you like. And it has very few uh, ramifications in the documentation side of the project. Then we have what we call kind of medium modifications. So things like, hey, the building today is, uh, say, so living kitchen dining is 18 feet wide. I'd love if it was 30 feet wide. And so this starts to get into a place where we're rethinking some of the, the roof structure, we're think, rethinking the truss sizes. There's some structural engineering here that we'll bring in our consultants for. It's still sort of within the same scope, but tends to be a little bit of extra time that goes into um, our, our consultants providing good guidance on the, on the structural side. Um, let's reroute the plumbing system for additional bathrooms or significant uh, kitchen changes or major layout changes. On the bathroom side, that, that matters because we might need to revise the, the plumbing plan or revise how that plumbing routing works. It might impact your, uh, the septic design you initially had. And so it has these sort of downstream effects where we need to make sure that we're accounting for that level of change. For things like, hey, let's add a second floor, something that we we certainly do and have done um, and often makes a lot of sense. But right out of the box, it, it, we kind of think about that as a medium scale uh, modification. And then on the large side, and we have heard things like this, and we, we do have an approach for how we address it. But we go start down the project and folks say, you know, the shape of these standards just isn't for me. Let's do something else entirely. Well, in that case, we're kind of talking about a new scope, a new approach, something different from our standard selection plus modifications process. Another would be, great, love the standard, but now I just want to add a whole other building, just some other custom building, whatever it might be. And so there's certainly going to be a scope change there and something that we wouldn't have accounted for up front, but now we need to address uh, kind of midstream in the project. And last is sort of like wild siting conditions. Hey, this all looks good, uh, but what if this whole thing was just like cantilevered off a cliff? It's like, love it, but we are absolutely going to have some consultants come in. We're definitely going to have some structural engineering in play. Um, and this is going to be categorized as sort of a large modification and likely sort of out of scope. And so thinking about those land, lifestyle, local conditions, and, um, and budget revisions. But another way to think about this is within small sets of revisions, it tends to be anything around code and zoning compliance. These are required to be able to turn your house from a design into an actual developed project. Um, we need to make sure that it adheres to the rules and regulations of your municipality or county or whoever um, uh, issues building permits. And so that's always going to be kind of part of the small world. Foundations, almost always kind of part of the small world too. And it's a place where 
we know that every piece of land is different. We specifically built our uh, land business and step one of uh, many of our projects in sourcing land under the understanding that some people want to be in sort of flat parcels. Some people want to be on a slope. Some people are in mountainous areas. Some people are in sort of valley or, or meadow conditions, um, which calls for different foundation conditions. And so we produced a standard set of kind of foundation ingredients for each one of these uh, these parcel types so that we can kind of quickly swap in what's most appropriate for that lot. And so this always kind of falls within the small category. And then interior spaces that um, within the, the shell or the envelope of the, of the standard, there's all kinds of ways we can shift walls, rotate things, open up spaces, close down spaces. Um, and it's something that we do all the time to again, make the um, adhere to the lifestyle requirements of, of our clients and their unique usages, whether it's a rental, family property, primary home, that tends to have different requirements on the, on the interior spatial layout. And we've sort of accounted for how do we push and pull our standard uh, to become unique to those clients utilizing interior spaces. On the medium side, again, uh, major mechanical and plumbing shifts, significant changes to structural form, flat roofs, shed roofs, much wider buildings, different sort of forms overall uh, will always have an impact on on framing and, and structural condition. And so this is a spot where we're often able to utilize a lot of what we have as uh, typical within our standards, but some of these structural pieces we need to revisit. And then large custom building types, kind of totally new sorts of spaces. And the impact on our um, on our scope is that everything within small, we've sort of accounted for. In the medium world, we may need to raise our hand and say, this is getting a little bit complex, and here's some of the impact on it. Either do we want to move forward with that, and here's the um, here's what's required of us and required of our consultants and our team to execute on the project, or is this a modification that is maybe not, um, maybe not worth the effort? And that's an ongoing conversation that we have with our clients through our sequence. Um, and then large, well always means we'll need to revise our estimates and revise our agreement to account for either additional consultants or additional effort from our team. And so I think it's always helpful to visualize what do we mean by things getting pushed and pulled? What do we mean by standards becoming sort of localized to land and lifestyle and, uh, and budget and, and lot condition with some real projects? And so in this case, all of these projects started from our three bedroom, two and a half bath, 1,560 square foot village uh, standard, which if you're familiar with it, it's um, kind of feels like three buildings arrayed around a center, uh, center entryway. One building is really public space, living kitchen, dining space. Uh, another is really the principal suite and the other is the, the guest bedrooms. And so it's a really amazing standard for what I'd call kind of 360 degree lots where there's something to see in every direction. It's not just here's a front, here's a back, here's the view, and then behind me is sort of nothing. Um, a lot of the parcels that we're working with, they, they're sort of immersive places, and the standard is really excellent as a way to take in views in every direction and treat the house as a bit of a sundial that as the, as the sun kind of moves around throughout the day, different places or uh, different volumes of space are getting very different light conditions. And so like, let's look at modifications through the lens of these projects in these different locations, different lot conditions using the village standard. And so here, this is a project in Livingston Manor, um, where we produce a series of small modifications. And this lot is sort of um, steep up and going up to a high promontory that has a forest in the, re in the rear that's really beautiful, and then sort of a ridgeline view in the front. And so you can see here that the types of edits that we've made from on the left, which is our sort of out of the box floor plan for our standard, to what we've done here on the right, which is the final plan for this home, are quite light. That the spatial arrangement is the same. We've made a couple of revisions to windows. There's a little bit of interior um, interior wall uh, pushing and pulling, but the plumbing has stayed the same. The structural arrangement has stayed the same. The kitchen. Uh, setup has stayed the same. We've made some changes to to closets, to uh, locations of bedroom spaces, but they're they're interior changes. And so all of this was very much within our our scope. 
Moving forward is another project that is, if you've been following along, it's our garden home. Uh, you, you might have seen some images of this under construction. Foundations are are poured, and I believe framing is starting this week. So this is well on its way. But this is another project that started from our village standard, and it includes both small and medium modifications. And so some of the things that you can see here right up front, even zoomed out, you can see that it's sort of mirrored. The, the building is sort of a mirrored space. But when we zoom in a little bit, you see this full staircase that's been added. That's to go up to a full height loft space, essentially a second floor um, above the living kitchen dining space, and turns around down to the basement, to a full basement, sort of in addition to, um, to this building. It's also a kind of revision in, in office space. The orientation of some of the plumbing is different. And some of the spaces in the building are, are wider um, and have different roof lines and roof pitches than kind of come out of the box. So you can see this is starting to include some additional pieces. It's starting to include um, structural revisions. It has some circulation changes on how you kind of move through the house, full staircases, different roof conditions and some uh, mechanical plumbing and electrical shifts that we would kind of count as medium changes. And so what that meant is that we worked through those, those edits and it added a little bit of time on our permitting and construction documentation to make sure that those were all accurately reflected before uh, we went for pricing with the, uh, the builder and before we submitted with the client for permits. Moving forward, this is our project in Sea Ranch in Central California about three hours north of San Francisco. And Sea Ranch as a community is famous for having some of the most, uh, one of the more restrictive design review processes uh, in the country. And so they have kind of a vernacular style of this raked shed roof. Um, they are deeply concerned around the context of the, uh, of the house uh, relative to its neighbors and to the overall design language of the community as a whole. and that in and of itself kind of pushes and pulls the standards. But in this case, our project started from our village scheme. And while it might seem like, wow, this is a radically different place, when you really start to dissect the DNA of, um, of the house, we've, we've really kind of taken programs and pushed them to one side or the other. Now, certainly there's a different roof shape here. There's changes in uh, mechanical and, and kitchen layout. But 75% of the detailing and wall assemblies and building science that we kind of baked into our village standard are still present here in what starts to feel like a very custom home uh, for, for Sea Ranch. And so I think that's illustrative to show um, that our standards as starting points don't necessarily mean that everything needs to be unified or that your house is the same as everyone else. This is a, a house that is uniquely uh, created and developed for Sea Ranch and really with our our clients in mind, but it didn't really push into kind of fully custom territory. It's not some completely other thing. We we're still able to use the lion's share of the ingredients that we have in our standards and realize a lot of the efficiencies that that affords us in being able to estimate the project cost up front and the efficiencies in being able to produce um, with our consultants the documentation for both town review and, and contractors. And then last, this is a project in, in Liberty, New York, where the starting point was we'd like a three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house, but we also want to add a professional-grade recording studio onto it. And so that recording studio is just a different thing. It's not sort of a modification of the standard. It uses different building logic. It uses different materials, has different requirements for acoustics and structural condition, it's its own building uh, with requires its own consultants and its own folks to get involved. And so we had to rescope the project and we had kind of a whole custom piece to help develop this, this element, bringing in uh, the outside resources we require and also figuring out how to merge our standard piece, which you see on the right, which is uh, essentially an out-of-the-box village home, connected to this custom studio. And so you can really start to see that here in plan that on the left, we have our standard, and yeah, there are some like some mirroring, some shifting in the in the house side, uh, the right side of the plan here, um, which would kind of qualify small and medium revisions. But the entirety of the studio is sort of its own thing. It represents a a large modification, and so hopefully that gave you a look at 
the reasons we modify houses, the degree to which we're able to modify homes to make them make them contextual, make them unique, make them yours, and make them fulfill your your requirements both on the budget side and the um, and the space planning side. And also gave you some context on what starts to feel like big changes or sort of custom things and what we do about that. Let me stop there and open it up for 10, 15 minutes of Q&A or as long as people have questions, uh, and we can go from there. Sarah writes, any more info re-adding second story? Yeah, I think that there's sort of two thoughts there. One, in all of our spaces, there's sort of loft spaces, which can have a full uh, a full staircase, and then there are true second floors. And so in the loft spaces, in those cases, we're just taking advantage of the empty space in the roof pitch. And our our roof lines tend to be pretty, pretty steep there. It's called a 12 over 12 roof pitch, um, which means that there's lots of head height above almost nine feet on the center line when you go up to the loft. But you have some not usable space on the edge um, where the uh, roof is coming down to meet the side wall. So it gets down to around three feet or so. And so the the most efficient and cost effective way to utilize height is by creating a loft. Um, and that would kind of constitute a small revision for us. A more medium sized revision would be we are raising the side walls so that you have eight foot walls on uh, either side on the uh, on the true second floor. And then that roof height above and you end up with you know, 12, 13 foot roof height um, or ceiling height in in those spaces above. And that would kind of constitute a, a medium sized change for us. Louisa asked, do you have an in-house estimator to understand budget changes with modifications? Uh, no, because the we're able to do our own takeoffs on our on our on our standards. And so because we've we have a very good understanding of what the um, what the material costs would be. Um, market by market, particularly on anything that's commodity, lumber, concrete, et cetera. We have a good working figure on uh, what your interior fixtures and finishes uh, should cost, but also because for many of our clients, they are going through uh, huts interior selections for procurement. We know exactly the cost. And then the, the change tends to be around local cost of labor, market by market, which there is some change there, but um, it's sort of easy, easy enough, easy enough for us to get an understanding of prevailing cost of construction by area, and so it really becomes sort of a matter of multiplication, multiplying material costs that we know quite well against square footage of the house that we're creating, um, a bit on the foundation condition, and then adding in uh, local labor costs for us to give get a very, very good estimate up front, and so. In a lot of ways, uh, all of our uh, project team are estimators uh, because they are able to produce pretty pretty accurate estimates on the projects as we go. Uh, Jonathan writes, you mentioned that windows are one component that can make a significant difference on budget. Are there single elements of that sort that have a real impact on, on budget? Yeah. So thinking about li big line item pieces that tend to go through some level of value engineering um, when we're when we're modifying or, or selecting finishes, and also like features. So a big one would be uh, in-floor radiant heating. That's one that sometimes it's a whole house radiant heating. Sometimes it's in, sometimes it's out, and it tends to be a binary cost where we say, hey, that's a $40,000 line item. I don't need that. I'm going to pull that out, and I'm going to run the house's heating off of um, either kind of a ducted or ductless uh, system and not use radiant. Another is, that we see is sort of a big item is uh, roof type. And we spec a lot of standing seam metal roofs. They're really beautiful, incredibly durable, generational warranty on them, but they can be pricey. Um, and so sometimes we'll look at an architectural shingle or another approach as a way to reduce some of the cost. Uh, but windows and doors are are a big piece of it. Windows and doors are can get quite expensive. And so both the number that you include, so sometimes we're sort of pulling out where there is glazing, um, the size of those of those pieces. So sometimes we'll sort of get into more standard sizing. Uh, and also the spec. And so who's the window manufacturer? What's the quality of the window? Ultimately, we like to have a a pretty high quality window for uh, efficiency for sustainability for uh, our value and retaining the 
sort of conditioning in the space. Um, just tends to be much more efficient, tighter envelope building with a better window. What materials you use in general and what type of construction for two-story buildings? So let me answer the construction for two-story buildings. Typical two by six wood framing in most cases. There are, there are select locations where we're producing prefabbed and panelized components, particularly in the Northeast where um, winter is sort of a major consideration and, and accelerating the speed that you kind of get the build team inside matters quite a bit. But generally, um, wood frame construction uh, for both our standards as one story, one story with loft or, or two stories. And then on the material side, two points here. One is on fixtures and finishes and insulation. We skew towards um, sustainably sourced materials that are ideally as little embedded carbon footprint, either from transportation or their manufacturing processes. And then also looking at things that are readily available. I think that one of our goals with our standards is that we have in the product development, thought a lot around what are the materials that we can utilize that seem to be typically available everywhere. Things like how do we utilize two by sixes that you can sort of buy at any lumber yard anywhere, as opposed to steel members that a lot of local contractors won't have much experience putting together or won't be readily available in a lot of markets. And so a big part of what we're thinking about, both for reducing the amount of shipping requirements for construction materials, but also for availability and speed is using things that are construction materials that are sort of um, a bit universal and, and sort of always in stock. Amy writes, do you help with choosing the best site to build uh, on the land I own? Do we have a wait period? How easy is it to add another building later in time? So a few questions here. Um, Amy, definitely recommend getting in touch and I'll send my email right after this so we can talk through some specifics of your project. But let me answer the, the first question to help with choosing the best site to build on uh, the land I, I own. Absolutely. And there's sort of two, two conditions we look at there. Well, three conditions. Um, the first is around where can the house be based on the land? And so can't build on top of wetlands, can't build on top of a 45 degree rock slope. Um, there are some places and some lots where Parts of it are just not buildable. It might be a very beautiful place, but not a spot to build a house. The second is looking at what are the kind of prevailing natural qualities on the on the parcel that we want to take advantage of. Whether it's uh, view, maybe there's a natural clearing that's already there, so we don't have to do much tree clearing. Maybe there's um, we always kind of map the sun path. Where uh, what kind of sunlight condition are you looking for? Is this a place where you'd like the um, from your principal suite to have sort of a sunset? Uh, sun condition, that's going to say something about the orientation of the house and location of the house. Um, you might have prevailing wind direction, and we might want to take advantage of that for natural ventilation. And so that's kind of a second world of kind of natural conditions. And and the third is, this particularly comes up with larger lots, is how to set up the infrastructure appropriately so that you find that balance between taking advantage of the best parts of your lot groundwork cost and still having budget available to build. And so what I mean by that is sometimes folks will come with a, come to us and say, hey, uh, we bought a you know 30 acre parcel somewhere. It's a, it's a big lot and we'd like to be way back there, way off the road. We don't want to see neighbors ever again. That sounds really great. The issue can be that driveway costs can add up quite a bit. You need to get to that site and all the construction needs to get to that site. And so um, in different places and depending on the slope, um, you might have a lot of linear run of driveway, which can get quite pricey. And so how do you find that balance between like being way back there, being off the road, being private, but not blowing your budget entirely before, you know, blowing your budget on a driveway? And so we kind of bring together those, those three factors. What does the land allow you to do based on where a septic can go if you need a septic? well, how far do you want to run power? How far do you run, want to run the driveway? And how do you take advantage of the best piece of the parcel? And so siting, Amy, another way to say it, siting is one of, I think, the most important things we do is helping to determine um, the best use and best locations on a property. Amy asks, do I need to get my zoning regulations and code compliances to you? Is that part of the process? Uh, that's absolutely part of the process, the first thing that we do. If you already have a parcel and... Um, it's in a location, the very first thing that we'll 
need to understand is what can happen on that property. I think it's, we don't want to go through the futile exercise of designing for something or planning for something or thinking about developing a property when the local code doesn't allow for it, or it's just going to be an incredibly arduous process to receive a variance. And so we want to understand what we can do on the lot before we start doing it. And so while I wait to see if another question comes in, let me uh, answer another one from Amy, who asked, how easy is it to add another building later in time? The way that I answer this is it's easier if you know that that might happen later. And so it's very, very typical that our clients have a grander ambition for their lot than they intend to construct first, that they have in mind a kind of phasing strategy. And so the way to account for a good phasing strategy is to think about infrastructure location to make it easy to, to add in another building later. How you orient the septic, the size of the septic, how where you run your, your power to make it easy to kind of splice off into other locations. Where is your well so that you can uh, take advantage of one well and have the maximum run to have the two buildings separated from each other. And so we are almost always thinking in our site planning stage, even before we get into the kind of design of the individual spaces and we're sort of just placing boxes on site, is what we're designing for the end of the project or is it sort of phase one? In which case, let's think ahead, not just a year from now, but maybe five years or 10 years from now and make it so that you're not digging up the entire lot again when you choose to build something in the future. And we have some of those places set up where you're somewhat easily able to plug in another building without uh, kind of totally disrupting the, the site. If we're out looking for land, what should we consider and what can or should we share with your team as we're trying to determine value and viability? This is definitely something I'll, I'll follow up with in a future webinar on land sourcing. But I think that the, on the viability side, there's going to be the things that are going to matter are septic viability, um, which is going to come from a perk test. The topography is going to say something about that. Uh, are there wetland conditions? Um, and if you're in, say, like the New York area, you have issues of like watershed, New York City watershed, which is usually a consideration. But the number one thing to share with us, because we have sort of lots of tips and tricks and tools to understand lots and dig into lots and sort of um, kind of go deep on what uh, the regulatory environment around, is around that lot and what the uh, kind of buildable conditions likely are on that lot, is to just send us the address. If we're engaged in a or the, or the lot ID. If we're engaged in a, a either land consultation or land sourcing engagement, we uh, conduct a lot of that research and come back and say, sort of yay or nay, here's why we like the lot and here's why we don't. Here's what some of the challenges might be and here are um, here's some of the best use to remove some of those challenges on that parcel. Um, and so that's a, that's a very typical scope for us to go through that sort of land consultation where Clients or potential clients are bringing us lots, and we're we're giving our um, assessment based on um, all the data we're able to kind of pull out about the parcel on why we like it or don't like it. Great. So thank you so much, everyone here for for joining. I really appreciate the smart and thoughtful and insightful questions. Um, I hope that this was this was helpful for everyone here. In the meantime, definitely check out huts.com. View the, uh, view the standards, think about what might be the best starting point for you. And, and remember, there's a, lots of space and lots of latitude for us to modify it and make it your own. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon.